This is Lake Mungo National Park, just before dawn. I'm here on ceremony business and ceremony research. And so I thought this would be a good place to begin a series of videos, actually, uh, exploring animism, exploring its key concepts and how and where we find them today. On the surface of it, you might think it's actually comparatively easy to provide a definition of animism, but actually it's not. Uh, I wrote a whole book sort of on the subject called Animistic, and it really swung on the definition and also uh, who gets to use it for whom. Now on the surface of it, you might say, oh, animism isn't that just everything has a spirit. And actually that's not too bad. It's just not, let's say, tactically useful when it comes to comparing animism to other cosmovisions. So the one that we typically settle on around here is that animism is living in a universe that is composed of a community of beings, or uh, animism is the extension of personhood beyond the human. That one has to have a little explanatory subtext for new people, which is, um, here I am at Lake Mungo. Lake Mungo is a person. It's not just humans. That's what I mean by the extension of personhood. So you live in a cosmos where it's not just humans that can be persons, it's all kinds of other beings as well. So Mungo is an interesting place. This whole trip feels like a scuba trip. And part of that is you do the whole thing literally on one tank. There is no uh, gas stations for several hundred kilometers around. So you fill up, I think it's about 150 in the closest town and you come to Lake Mungo National Park and the petrol you have is the petrol you have to do what you need to do. So in that sense, it feels like going somewhere with the resources you bring with you and then come back. And here at the lodge, it's the same because obviously there's no, if there's no gas station, there's certainly no supermarket. Uh, and so there's uh, a satellite situation, I think, for the phone. Uh, there's 4G because there's a little airport here um, for private visitors but you have that same sense of like if there's no pumpkin in the uh, kitchen that's what it is the whole place feels very uh, contained the things you bring in are the things you have until you leave again and my first impression of country is and perhaps this is a little unfair uh, by way of comparison but it doesn't have the same sanctity as other Aboriginal sites that have become World Heritage Areas, like Uluru. That's what I mean, that's a bit unfair. You can really only compare Uluru to <coughs> Ausangate, uh, St. Peter's, it, it's that kind of elevation. But it, it feels more normal, it feels more lived in, and uh, the, the energy of the lake, the, uh, the, the feeling of the country, is um, she, has, she has business to do, which we're going to discuss in this video. One of the ways Mungo first slips through your perception is with the name. Uh, no one knows how Lake Mungo came to be named such. There are two obvious contenders. The first is that it was named by some Scottish settlers in the 1860s after the patron saint of Glasgow, St. Mungo. The other possibility is that it comes from a uh, from language in one of the uh, local mobs because it sounds almost like the word canoe. Now it's a uh, ancient dried up lake bed so uh, it could be named canoe as a form of memory of times when these same people were living around the lake or the fact that it's kind of a canoe shape because you're in a dried up lake bed. Magicians and synchromystics I think have already leapt to the realization, oh, it's both. Some of St. Mungo's miracles include the resurrection of a dog and the resurrection of a bird. So it's actually bringing things back into the life of the living. So we have that, and we have uh, the archetype of the canoe, which carries family groups, which moves across water and so on. So here we are in this place that you're about to find out about that uh, has a, a slippery name because what it needs to do, I would say, uh, requires uh, dual origins for its name. So this video has place in the title rather than space. From an animist perspective, there's kind of no such thing as space. Space is an emptiness. 
which is the opposite uh, experience of animists and the more than human and the more than country, right? So I make a joke in my book, <laughs> uh, not even space is space. Like even space is a place to uh, echo Sun Ra. So when we talk about sacred space, it's almost an oxymoron for uh, animists because the place in which you do ceremony is a place in which, uh, with which you do ceremony. So we want to talk about Mungo as place and place as person as an example of, of exploring this idea. And the first place to begin, I suppose, is it's fraught history. It's fraught colonial history. Uh, I mean, you can tell this is not a great place to attempt European style pastoralism, but nevertheless, they did. And I went about as well as you could expect for the first 40 or 50 years attempting to turn the lake bed into a sheep station. And then two families rather than one got together and ended up making something of a, a commercial success of it for a while. But the, the lake itself has, uh, has a fraught relationship with, and this will be important in a minute, with the uh, colonial encounter. The next part of its fraught colonial history that's probably worth mentioning uh, before we explain why uh, is the World Heritage listing that it got. It was Australia's first World Heritage application uh, in the early 80s, I think 80, 81. And it took more than a decade to actually get approved. It was a, a mess of discovering what the protocols and the requirements were to get through it. And so Mungo goes through that process, and it's, what, it's a kind of classic example of crawling so others could walk, because after that, all the other World Heritage applications that Australia went through became cleaner and easier and smoother. So much like the, the sheep stations getting it wrong until they got it right, there's something about Mungo's capacity to uh, teach conservation and even uh, museum business that will be relevant. So why did all of this stuff happen at this lake? Well, and why is this a good place to explore animism's experience of place as a being? Before we get into that, we need to come back to the idea of place as a person, place as a being, because it's all well and good to nod along and say, yes, 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 I, I think that too. We don't tend to extend agency to these other beings uh, until um, we've had that pointed out to us. And in fact, Bayo Kumalafe uh, says that post-activism and making sanctuary is the extension of agency beyond the human. It's realizing that uh, other beings are contributing to the welding of what we go through. So let me tell you a little bit geologically, I suppose, uh, about Lake Mungo. During the Ice Age, uh, it was a lake, uh, hence its name. And people lived along its edges and, and drank from it and fished from it and so on for tens of millennia. And then the Ice Age ended and the lake dried up. What happened at that point was that the clay uh, that turned to dust in the lake bed blew up against the lake shore and covered the what we would know as historical remains, so the fire pits and, and all the rest of it. So it, the lake dried up and sealed the... Uh, evidence of the people who lived along it. And then that was overgrown by native vegetation and held in place for 13,000 years, which was quickly undone in the space of a few decades by some sheep farming. So what happened then is that the native uh, cover was removed and erosion started to happen. And as that erosion happened, the ancient lake bed began to be revealed. So it's this peculiar layering of uh, improbable events that gives us this very precious, rare archaeological jewel in the same way that uh, Gobekli Tepe is such an unlikely uh, descent down to us. This one's much older. Some of, the, um, some of the more exciting finds here is much older. But it puts you in the... It poses the question to you of whether this is a special place, because it is now, or whether this is a typical place, and it's just because of a very unusual collection of geological and, and human circumstances that we have these things. Like, was every lake like Lake Mungo, or was Lake Mungo special? We don't know, <laughs> right? Because the only one that uh, performed this, this gentle covering and protecting of these precious treasures through time 
was Lake Mungo herself. And we say it that way because, actually, I do believe all lakes are persons, but the other uh, necessary technicality of moving into a cosmos of beings cosmology, which is animism, is, okay, cool, I get that lakes are persons, what about rocks? And then the answer is yes, you can think of some of them, speaking of uh, Scotland, like Stone of Destiny and so on. But is every rock a person? Now, the Ojibwe would say no. Uh, a rock is a person if it's done something, which is to say if it has agency. So now we get back to understanding, okay, well, I actually do think all lakes are people. But Lake Mungo is a ghost lake who packed up some archaeological re uh, remains and kept them safe for 13,000 years, and then in the space of a few decades revealed them, and I'm about to explain, went on to change the world of ceremony and our understanding of humanity. So that's a lake that did something. So from an Ojibwe perspective, Lake Mungo absolutely is a person. She's a, a ghost lake and a museum curator, we might want to say. And the two most important or hero finds uh, in Lake Mungo so far have been aptly named Mungo Man and Mungo Lady. Uh, and for a couple of decades there, and particularly in the case of Mungo Lady, it was the earliest evidence of ceremony anywhere on the planet at 40,000 years. Uh, now that's no longer the case. There's the ceremony that's about 100,000 years old in Africa and a few other examples moving um, throughout Eurasia. I mean, 40,000 isn't young, but it still is the, at the last time I looked anyway, the oldest evidence of a funeral, of a ceremony of burial because she's cremated. Mungo Man is older and Mungo Man for Australia was used as a country, was used to date and even this one's no longer the oldest, um, some of the earliest arrivals of uh, the First Nations people into this landmass. So it has these two precious jewels, uh, preeminent among them, I think, is Mungo Lady. At a 40,000 year time depth, we have this, this woman's funeral. Uh, it also has, at a 20,000 year time depth, the largest collection of Ice Age human footprints anywhere in the world. And they're, they're beautiful and touching. There is a a video presentation about them in the, frankly, unloved visitor center. The, the unloveliness of the visitor center, which is no um, shade on the two people I spoke to who actually worked there, <laughs> the ranges, but it's something straight out of 1985. And I have to say this surprises me given the, the cultural value of the place, but it's, it's so unusual to get to, and a lot of people don't know it. Uh, the nearby town of Mildura, where I overnighted to get my rental car and, and so on, None of the five or six people I spoke to had ever been here. And it's an hour away. And, and they all say like, oh, you never do the stuff near where you live. It's like, yeah, fine. But this is the oldest evidence of, of a funeral ceremony. You know, this is a world heritage. This isn't a theme park. <laughs> I mean, talk about threatening me with a good time. There's a ghost lake that has the oldest evidence of ceremony on Earth. You couldn't stop me. I mean, you couldn't have stopped me. I got a car, put it on a boat drove, swapped cars. This is a four day process <laughs> to get here, to come and see it. Right. So, uh, I'm surprised at the unloveliness of the visitor center. Uh, it's, um, an indication that I don't think Mungo herself has finished doing her work. And, and I think she's due for the next phase of it when we can understand what a, a lake looks like as a museum, as, as a person that is also a museum. Hence the point of this video. So in the, uh, in the little short film uh, about the documentary, there's a, um, a, an indigenous woman from the local mob, and I've written down the quote, when she's talking about, she puts her feet on the earth next to the 20,000 year old footprints. And she says, my footprints, their footprints, time between us, no distance. And why I think Mungo still has more museum work to do is that it's a, a, a powerful container of the difference between uh, indigenous time and materialist linear time. And when I say indigenous time, I mean uh, experiences of time as beings, which is far more animist. We have this idea of linear time that was a premise or a guess of the enlightenment, uh, where um, it's one damn thing after another in a line uh, progressively, which is where we get progressive from, improving into a better and better future, which is idiotic. Um, that, that is not shown in uh, climate models, that's not shown in civilization studies, <laughs> that's not how time moves, okay? Uh, 
when it comes to Aboriginal Australia, they're probably, if not the best, co-equal best with, I would say, the Maya uh, in their sophistication when it comes to time. Because we just breezed past something that I think is fascinating. Mungo Lady is 40,000 years old. The footprints are 20,000 years old. So 10 Jesus lengths, 10 times 2,000 years, separates this woman whose um, funeral we, in a real sense, have attended. And these footprints of these family groups uh, by the edge of a ghost lake. And that's still 20,000 years away from us. Aboriginal Australia, I think, understands how to live in sacred time, in eternal time, better than anyone else. And they kind of have to, because they're dealing with time lengths that we just can't wrap our heads around, because we're trying to wrap our heads around them with a linear time model. In the video, there's another elder. They get some elders down from, it looked like, um, the Red Centre, because I heard one of them say Chukupa. I didn't recognise the mob name. They got some traditional Aboriginal trackers down to read the uh, footprints when they were discovered. And this one tracker, he's walking along and he's pointing at this woman's footsteps and he says, uh, um, a woman walked here in the dream. And the way he says it is um, this moment 20,000 years ago is still alive, uh, like a woman is walking there in the dreaming. And so if you're new to this idea, I want to read you a little quotation about the dreaming from one of my all-time heroes, Wade Davis, explorer in residence for National Geographic, amongst other things, but like the guy who I think uh, exemplifies adventure as epistemology. When I grow up, I want to be Wade Davis, put it that way. Critically, the dreaming is not a myth or a memory. It is what happened at the time of creation, but also what happens now and what will happen for all eternity. In the Aboriginal universe, there is no past, present, or future. In not one of the hundreds of dialects spoken at the moment of contact was there a word for time. There is no notion of linear progression, no goal of improvement, no idealization of the possibility of change. To the contrary, the entire logos of the dreaming is stasis, constancy, balance, and consistency. The entire purpose of humanity is not to improve anything. It is to engage in the ritual and ceremonial activities deemed to be essential for the maintenance of the world, precisely as it was at the moment of creation. Imagine if all of Western intellectual and scientific passion had focused from the beginning of time on keeping the Garden of Eden precisely as it was when Adam and Eve had their fateful conversation. So that's good. Uh, what I would say is he uses some words that I think have a negative connotation, like stasis. Uh, I would prefer, and we'll talk about it later in this video, something like ever-present origin. But I need to give you a little bit more of um, Wade. As Aborigines track the song lines and chant the stories of the first dawning, they become part of the ancestors and enter the dream time, which is neither a dream nor a measure of the passage of time. It is the very realm of the ancestors, a parallel universe where the ordinary laws of time and space and motion do not apply, where past, future, and present merge into one. It is a place Europeans can only approximate in sleep, and thus it became known to early English settlers as the, as the dreaming or dream time. But the term is misleading. A dream, by Western definition, is a state of consciousness divorced from the real world. Dream time, by contrast, is the real world, or at least one of two realities experienced in the daily lives of the Aborigines. See, that's a lot better. And this is what that elder meant when he said a woman walks here in the dream time, because he's in contact with a moment in time in the past that is alive because she's in the dreaming. She's in the dream time, which means she's in the realm of the ancestors and she's also an expression of that ever-present now. So that when they talk about my footsteps, their footsteps, no difference in time between us, this is, this is how that's experienced, this moment of sanctity in time, as time. And one of the ways or reasons I think uh, Mungo still has more to teach in that respect is when it comes to, dare I say, correcting Western models of time away from a linear model, more towards certainly a cyclical one with astrology, et cetera, et cetera, uh, but at least a sacred one. The, the geological at Lake Mungo is in many respects dwarfed by the human. So it upends, I quite like the geological notion of deep time, I quite like some of the spells that linear time can cast, like that 
But here, the geological is younger than the human. It, it has to be in order for the lake to dry up, for the clay to turn to clay dust to, <laughs> to cover remains. Do you, know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? So one of the things Mungo teaches us is uh, even the, the progressive assumptions of like there's geological that's old and there's biological that's almost as old and then there's human which is new. It, it brings trouble to that. It brings useful trouble to that idea. And it invites us to consider these things all on the one timeline and all in a sense of an eternal now. So I'm, gonna, so I'm going to continue that idea with uh, a reading from <laughs> my own book that I've mentioned twice, uh, Animistic. The dreaming is the perpetual emerging of the world from a continuous and continuously present moment of creation, from the internal to the outward, from the invisible to the visible. One of the 20th century's most significant explorers of Aboriginal life worlds, Deborah Bird Rose, in an article called To Dance With Time, a Victoria River Aboriginal study, wrote that the Uralan time, Uralan being a mob up there, rather than being rendered static or absent, becomes experientially and overwhelmingly focused, present, and shared. The person flips from being an actor in time to being a heartbeat of time. We have little ways into that with our magic, right? So Dr. Jeremy Nadler, who wrote, I think, the best books um, ever, really, in as close to mainstream Egyptology as you can get, said that the ancient Egyptians didn't so much measure time as they did mark it. So that when the pharaoh would greet the sun, it would be man's share of that event. So it was the f humanity's participation in the sunrise was that ceremonial marking. And that's close to what we're talking about with the dream time and stepping into the experience of the ever-present now. And why that's important, there's a couple of reasons. So the founder of permaculture, Bill Mollison, uh, once said that the principal preoccupation of Aboriginal civilization is time. And somewhere like, like Mungo, you get that. Uh, just try and picture 40,000 years around a lake and spending that in sacred time. It's the only way you could do it because the time depths are too great. Think of like all the classical civilizations of recorded history, if you laid them end to end, wouldn't make it in between Mungo Lady and the footprints. And that's just the middle third <laughs> that we have access to. Now, why I think this is secondarily important from, so Bill Mollison um, giving us the opportunity to think very seriously about Aboriginal frameworks of time because they had 60,000 years to get it as close to right as possible. The other is from Psydata and near-death experiences. So a few years ago on the show, I had a woman by the name of Elizabeth Crone on to talk about the near-death experience she had being struck by lightning in the car park of her temple in, uh, in, in Texas, in Dallas, I believe. And when she was on the other side, she could experience, she describes it as like cake almost, but she could experience that time would move directionally all out in front of her and all behind her in like a cube. And so she could go up and to the left to find something back there in the past in a certain way. And so outside of her body, outside of the experience of being down here in the physical, she has an experience of time where somehow all things are always happening at once. That's the dreaming. That's the dream time. And the invitation to understand that uh, and to understand that we are here as an emanation of it and we can live in that um, two modes of thinking and need to live in those two modes of thinking, uh, I find very compelling. So I want to return to Mungo Lady. Um, her physical remains were discovered in 1968. And at that time, something really powerful happened to the Western, at least, understanding of human history. Now, I've been to the little back garden in Bath in England where William Herschel first uh, discovered Uranus with his telescope. He wanted to name it George, which would have sucked. Uh, astrologers trying to find out what, uh, I don't know, George and Taurus might mean uh, is, uh, is pretty sucky. Anyway, there's a peculiar feel in that garden because this man who was not up to the task planning, he's a reasonably good composer, but obviously not a good planet namer, 
in that garden, the size of our solar system doubled in a moment. Because he, that's how far out Uranus is. Like if you actually look at a map of the solar system, that's why we couldn't see it for so long. The size of the solar system doubled. When Mungo Lady, uh, when, when the lake revealed Mungo Lady and uh, we ascertained her age using modern methods, a similar thing happened because this is 1968 is still the mid 20th century where we thought, honestly, people 10,000 years ago were basically stupid and had no sense of self and just like wandered around, I don't know, eating raw crickets. It, it, it was stupid, right? But we find a funeral at 40,000 years. And a funeral is a very powerful ceremony, of course, because it shows the, uh, it, should, it demonstrates a couple of things, an awareness of an afterlife, obviously, so that we don't just let their body drop uh, on the ground. But also um, the care amongst the living for someone they will miss. So it's very beautiful and very complex. And there was nothing, <laughs> right, for tens of millennia. And then Mungo Lady shows up and doubles the amount of time on this planet that we've been doing ceremony. That's a very powerful magician. And we want to say it that way because in the experience of sacred time, her life is happening around the edges of that ghost lake right now. Uh, and her funeral is happening. And so that ceremony of sending her into the afterlife uh, is almost like with the mission of, of bringing about 20,000 years of ceremony, 20,000 years of ceremony back to academic understanding. That's big magic. And I think one of the things Mungo is still yet to do as a lake is to move our, our thinking and our understanding in that direction, to have agency of things outside of Western humans and linear time uh, to make room for them, to make sure that um, their voices are heard. And I want to give you uh, another quotation from my book by, uh, so I've, I've long been interested since university in the thinking of a Narinian uh, elder by the name of David Mawaljala. The key experiential difference is that in a machine universe, the past implies that a time a time that is over, complete, and fixed. This can only occur in a universe that is already formed rather than one which is continually forming, and a dreaming model is a continuous emanation model. Hannah Rachel Bell was one of David Merle Jalai's lifelong friends, as well as being his principal, creative, equivocal, collaborator, translator, partner within the Whitefella academic and educational world. In Storymen, which is her book, she described how she initially thought the Nyarinian storyteller's continual use of the present tense was due to their unfamiliarity with English before coming to the understanding that it is a deliberate evocation of a conception of time where the past and the future exist literally in a continuous present in which there can only be before and after an event. When Bell listened to Merle Jawai's stories of events depicted on the Wanjina paintings in Northwest Australia, yeah. he would say these events happened before our time or sometimes in ancestral times while conveying ancestral time is also now as the ancestors are still here. So David Mulgale, who is talking about time being before or after an event, which it would be typically the experience of now, but uh, anything before a landslide or an earthquake is before times and anything after it is after, maps to the near-death experiences of people like Elizabeth Crone, where that's, that's kind of true. Like you can access the entire past uh, uh, we have just told a story here in the bodies because we experience it in a linear fashion, that it moves in a linear way. But actually, you get out of the body, <laughs> and it doesn't look like that. So David Merle Jale is, is trying to teach this to Hannah, uh, and he's also trying to teach to, he's dead now, but he's also trying to teach to the country uh, pattern thinking or two-way thinking. And let me explain why that's uh, important. Merle Jale spent the last years of his life promoting and teaching what he called two-way thinking. In a certain sense, this was his own attempt to bring a wider and urgent legitimacy to an equivocal epistemology. As the name suggests, it is based on the idea that whitefella and blackfella cultures can now collaborate in processing of knowledge and that these processes must be 
as Mo al Jale said, side by side, not one on top of the other. Two-way thinking combines what he calls pattern thinking, an animist mode of understanding relationality and interconnectedness, and triangle thinking, which sees the world as fixed, separate, completed points. So I've got a final way, Davis, on the pattern thinking, because this is the this is the loop. You have to get into the proverbial canoe completely or not in order to understand Lake Mungo as a a being who is doing things like teaching us or, or dare I say correcting our errors about time. This is a story from uh, Wade Davis's The Wade Finders of him walking with an Aboriginal man. As we walked the land together, I was astonished not only by the depth of Otto's knowledge, but even more so by his way of knowing. His thinking was completely nonlinear, a sort of magical pattern of what seemed to be free association. The trail of ants would lead to sweat bees, a comb of honey dug from the ground prompted a reference to a mythic bird, talk of a spirit, which in turn brought us back to the Morning Star songline, Rock Wallaby Dreaming, and the utility of the paperback or paper bark tree, a source of shelter, and so much more. Kapok trees coming into bloom implied that baby kangaroos or joeys have enough hair to survive the death of their mothers. A yellow red blossom on an unknown tree with a color suggestive of the fat of an emu revealed to Otto the proper time to hunt the long necked turtle. So in a cosmology or a cosmovision where it's not just humans that have agency, that means this whole community of beings that we consider a cosmos is alive with meaning and communication. So what looked like a nonlinear free association to Wade is a language of interbeing, Charles Eisenstein might call, an understanding that from the spirit world to the birds you can probably hear all around me, there are other agencies co-creating the world with us. And if that's the case, and it is, then that means lakes can be museums. Uh, who else is going to do it? And it comes back to the idea of um, history as ceremony, of the keeping of stories, of the keeping of, of the before times as a form of ceremony, and who gets to do it. Is it just humans that do ceremony? I don't think so. And you might jump to biological examples, which are true nevertheless, like Corvins will have their own funerals, uh, but it also happens in the spirit world. It's also from a magical understanding, stuff that happens when humans aren't around or that we can't see with our normal human eyes. So the very idea that a, um, a ghost lake can be a museum brings with it, in order for that to be true, it has to bring with it the um, pattern language understanding to make that true. Because uh, cosmologically, we experience where we are in this moment, Lake Mungo as dried up, as desert. But it's not in the dreaming. It is a, a beautiful lake. It is a lake that people lived around for tens of millennia because there was a bunch of berries growing on <laughs> the edges of it, all the fresh water you could drink, there's fish, there's animals to hunt. It's a desert now. It was actually just pleasantly warm for tens of millennia back then. It would have been a paradise. She is still that in the dreaming. And those campfires, and this is where we start to move into, I think, the apocalypse medicine of what... Um, she might have to teach us if we can see that she's teaching us and step into that pattern understanding. The, from our perspective, the people who lived on the edges of that lake lived through an apocalypse. They lived through a, a dramatic change and they're still here living differently, but there is a medicine of transformation here that I think was very struck uh, as I go about Lake Mungo, by this idea that in the dreaming, those campfires around the edges of Lake Mungo are still alive. And where we are now, those campfires are returning. Okay, so she's re-revealing the edges of this old lake. And it's, it's very, it's almost got an Edgar Allan Poe ghost story feel to it, where the uh, the campfires of people from a lost civilization are being relit, and that tells the story that change can happen. In my healing tradition, it's called a pachacuti, like a cosmos overturner. And there's something about the ancestors from a previous era 
uh, coming back at this exact moment that we're going through what we're going through that has me thinking and feeling there is a, a strangely optimistic apocalypse medicine that Mungo has to offer if we can step into the way of thinking that will allow the delivery of that medicine. Yeah. Lake Mungo is an animist museum. And I, I say that because uh, one of the ways I think, and this is why this is a being with almost like messy terrestrial business to do. This isn't a, a divine elevated collection of beings like you get at Uluru. Lake Mungo has to go through the bureaucratic process of um, being the first to get World Heritage listing. And one of the first, so obviously because it was the 60s, these, um, these ancestral remains were taken from their land and put in museums and universities to be studied. They have been returned. Mungo Lady was returned, uh, I believe, in the 90s, and Mungo Man was only returned in 2017. And, but they were returned well because it was the, um, the local descendants, obviously, and, and for good, that took the remains and, and placed them somewhere around the edge of the lake in secret. No one knows where they are. No one came with them so that he's, he's resting with his people on the edge of the lake again. And that's nice. That's the right way of doing it. But this is what I mean by Lake Mungo being a museum. That's what a museum should be on its best day, a sacred container of living jewels of the past in, that, in the sense that it's still with us, that is being cared for, uh, that has as its custodian the lake in such a way that is available for us to learn from. That's what our museum should be on their best day. They've got a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> especially the European museums. But this is a lake with 60,000 years experience of humans. It has gone through multiple uh, cosmos overturns, multiple changes, and has done so in such a way that she continues to unveil and teach us about the past that she's been through I think this is a being we should listen to.